It's been a real pleasure for the first two screenings to be in an audience in the theater, seeing Sturgis on the big screen and laughing together. It's just such a good, good experience. And it's also really nice to see the films in proximity to each other. Um, so to have them inside of a series, um, seeing some of the same actors show up in parts, um, and seeing Sturgis's ongoing appreciation of, uh, well, crook, crooks and gamblers, uh, the crooked folks of the title of um, Stuart Clowens's book, Crooked But Never Common. Um, and uh, for those of you who are here for the other two nights, um, or two programs, um, you know that our uh, laughter was aided by the insights of um, Stuart, who's been here to introduce the programs. He's a film critic and author of um, the book I just mentioned, Crooked But Never Common, which um, we um, used as the basis of deciding to have this series to celebrate its publication. And so we're really great for, grateful for Stuart Clowens for both um, curating the series and coming out to introduce these three programs. This is the last program he'll be at. Uh, some of you came early for the book signing um, and, um, of his wonderful book, which, is a, we, which we designed to be a companion to the series. Um, it did sell out at the book signing, but um, <laughs> which is good news of, of how many people are using it as a companion. Um, but um, our bookstore, uh, Jim and our bookstore assures me more on, are on order and they'll be here probably before two weeks, but within two weeks. And just in case you haven't heard about the book, I'll read one quote from uh, Jeremy Carr. If one thing is clear by the end of Crooked But Never Common, it's that Preston Sturgis is surely in a class by himself, an uncommon filmmaker, particularly for his era, who has given his due in Clowens' enthusiastic and, and knowledgeable examination. Um, so I'm really uh, grateful for uh, Stuart being here again tonight, and I want to thank him for the pleasures of the two nights we've had already, and for the pleasures to come in the series that la lasts through the middle of August. So please join me in welcoming Stuart Clawless. Thank you, Kathy, for that very generous introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. It's really wonderful to, to see you all here, um, to enjoy what I consider the funniest movie ever made. Um, but you'll come to your own conclusions about that. Um, the Miracle of Morgan's Creek is the seventh of the pictures that Preston Sturgis both wrote and directed during his astonishing eight film run at Paramount. It was the biggest box office success of all. No thanks to Paramount's head of production, Buddy De Silva, who held the film back from distribution for a year, imposed his own edit, which proved in previews to be disastrous, and then had to relent and allow Sturgis to restore the picture to its original version. The fact that people then lined up around the block to see the miracle of Morgan's Creek, with General Eisenhower himself as one of its declared fans, not bad uh, for a movie with the military theme released during wartime, um, it had the predictable effect of making the boss hate Sturgis even more. But despite De Silva's overbearing interference. He was neither Sturgis's principal obstacle in making the miracle of Morgan's Creek, nor was he the primary target of Sturgis's wit. Here is the real antagonist, Joseph Breen, Hollywood's chief in-house censor as head of the production code administration. Folks, it's truly been said, after the age of 40, every man gets the face he deserves. <laughs> the Miracle of Morgan's Creek carried forward and intensified Preston Sturgis's historic one-man assault on the sexual prudery that Breen enforced. Like some other filmmakers, notably Ernst Lubitsch, Sturgis had been playfully transgressing the limits for years, with a deadpan double entendre here and artfully timed fate to black there. In his fifth film, The Palm Beach Story, 
Sturgis dared to go much further. He made a comedy that was explicitly about marriage as legalized prostitution. It was the story of a woman who asked why the economic value of her sexual allure shouldn't be respected as much as the entrepreneurial inventiveness of her husband's business plans. Breen objected strenuously, but Sturgis managed to make the picture anyway. Those earlier assaults on the production code at least had a gloss of high sophistication, as you can see from this morally dubious but impeccably tasteful image from the Lady Eve. But the miracle of Morgan's Creek is something entirely more loud, vulgar, and cheap. Barbara Stanwyck and Henry Fonda, Claudette Colbert and Rudy Valley, steamship staterooms and millionaire resort towns are all gone. You're left to face the facts of life in a dingy small town with a couple of actors who were second bananas instead of stars. I think this poster pretty well captures the tenor of the proceedings. <laughs> Observe the note of hysteria. I, I don't mean hysterical comedy, but uh, uncontrollable out emotional out out desperation. Um, so, um, You'll forgive me, I can see you or I can see this. <laughs> as you'll see, The Miracle of Morgan's Creek is structured as a succession of emotional breakdowns, one character after another, which makes sense in a film that explicitly talks about psychology, or psychology, depending on which scene you're watching. <laughs> Things get so unsettled between William Demarest as the Constable Cockenlocker and, um, and and Eddie Bracken as Norval, uh, that at one point, Constable Cockenlocker eventually blows Norval a kiss through the barrel of a gun. Uh, the full implications of that one couldn't even be imagined by the production code. Um, nevertheless, Sturgis faced so many objections from Breen's office and from De Silva, and on top of them, from US military censorship that he was forced to do something on Morgan's Creek that he'd never done before, and he would never do again. He went into production without a finished script. He shot in the studio all day, then went home to work all night on the next day's scenes. As you can imagine, there were tensions on the set, with Sturgis sometimes bringing Betty Hutton and Diana Lynn to tears. He also went too far in writing Eddie Bracken, who usually played a schnook, but was in fact a champion amateur boxer. Um, on the day that uh, Sturgis went too far, Bracken resolved the issue by looking Sturgis in the eye, smiling and cocking his fist. Uh, on the other hand, there were scenes that required take after take because Bracken and Hutton couldn't get through them without laughing. Uh, this is one of those scenes, uh, the wedding of Trudy and Norville, in which it turns out that Norval Stammer is contagious. You'll probably be able to nominate a few of these scenes for yourself. Now, somehow Sturgis finished the picture, a movie that asked why a nice young woman like Betty Hutton ought to be shamed and punished for giving a rousing, memorable send-off to the GIs going to war. <laughs> yes, there were consequences which couldn't be hidden for long. On the other hand, Everybody thinks these young men deserve the best, and a girl ought to be allowed some fun. What I want to point out is that in fighting to make these movies, and it was a fight, Sturgis went far beyond violating one or another of the production code's rules, or six or seven of them. Those rules were made to safeguard the studios from the financial and legal risks of offending the sensibilities of the American public. But that's exactly what the Palm Beach story and the miracle of Morgan's Creek did. They insulted one of the most cherished beliefs of the modern Western world, that each Jill has her predestined Jack and each Jack a Jill made just for him, so they need to get married now and stay that way. My question is, how does Sturgis get away with exploding the very idea of monogamy? I will suggest that a large part of the reason is simply a sense of play. The Miracle of Morgan's Creek is the story of a girl who's good at having fun and a boy who's far too serious but nevertheless lets himself be pressed into playing dress-up. In fact, he gets to the point where he volunteers for it. 
He is no good at imposture, of course, and the results are catastrophic. But it's all right because he's played by Eddie Bracken, who gives one of the greatest performances of physical comedy in movie history. A second reason Sturgis could get away with his attack on monogamy was that he constructed it on a known pattern. And patterns make audiences comfortable. They know where they are. The pattern in this case is biblical. The miracle of the title is a travesty of the nativity story in which Betty Hutton becomes, if not the first or most blessed of all virgin mothers, then certainly the hardest working. <laughs> that might have made audiences more rather than less outraged, but everything worked out. As James A.G. wrote, watching the miracle of Morgan's Creek is a little like conversing with a nun on a roller coaster. <laughs> so now I hand these, this picture over to you to enjoy. Once again, I want to give my heartfelt thanks to Bamfa for having me here and for you being here. I want to say it's an immense privilege to be able to share in even one molecule of Preston Sturges' glory by presenting this picture to you. Thank you for being here to receive it.